Welcome to Evil Done Badly, the worst true crime podcast on the internet. We've got another crazy, crazy bitch story for you this week, and this one is bonkers. She's got an abundance of testosterone coursing through her veins, and she scares the crap out of me. That doesn't actually take much, because I am a bit of a pussy, and you didn't need to know that, so I'm going to edit that out. This crackpot was suggested by our resident heckler, Marty Bass, 1976, and I can't wait to dig into it. So grab a beverage, hold on to your arse, and let's talk about Eileen Wernos. But first, cue the theme song. <laughs> this week's episode of Evil Done Badly is brought to you by the band, The Fondlers, and their new album, Playground Cabaret. Features such hit songs as Banana Pants, The Candyman's Van, Floppy Bird, Squeeze Me, and Trench Coat Tango. Available on 8-track and cassette tape from K-Smell Records. Give yourself some happy feels and get down with The Fondlers. And please join the Wide World Paranormal Investigations Group on Facebook. They've got over 10,000 members now which is about 10,000 more members than we've got listeners. So you know it's going to be a good time. Now back to the show. Eileen Wernos was born in February 1956 in Michigan, and as far as childhoods go, Eileen's was pretty much as fucked up as you can get. She had a terrible upbringing, and it's no wonder she turned out to be a little unstable. She never knew her father, who was schizophrenic, and in jail for kidnapping and raping a seven-year-old girl at the time she was born. He would eventually hang himself, or get strangled while he was in prison, it depends on who you ask. So you can see that she's genetically likely to turn out completely, uh, um, well, backwards. Her mom abandoned her and her brother when she was four, and they got sent off to her mom's parents' house, both of whom were rabid alcoholics. By the age of 11, she realized that she could perform sexual favors to help her procure smokes and drugs. That's a useful skill, I guess, um... She was also reportedly screwing her brother at one point, so, uh, yeah, um, okay. She was reportedly sexually assaulted and beaten by her grandfather and non-consensually knocked up at 14 by a friend of her grandfather's. She dropped out of school around here, and I can't really imagine she was a straight-A student. So, she has a baby, and she puts it up for adoption, and when her grandmother died of liver failure, her grandpa booted her out, and she began living in the woods and became a tree-dwelling prostitute. This is really depressing stuff. She was a loser on both sides of the nature-nurture equation, and she didn't have much of a chance. So, uh... She's going to have a few brushes with the law here. And her first brush with the law came in 1974 when she was charged with a DUI and firing a pistol from a moving vehicle. She didn't bother to show up to court, so she was charged with a failure to appear as well. But none of that's too crazy. It's a little reckless, a little dangerous, but uh, maybe, maybe there's some hope for her. Maybe she won't be that nuts after all. So, what does any self-respecting, forest-dwelling hooker do? Well, they find themselves a sugar daddy and live happily ever after. Yay! So, Eileen meets a 69-year-old yacht club president, gets married and lived happily ever after for nine whole weeks. 
during these nine weeks of wedded bliss, she gets charged with assault at a bar. She throws a pool ball at a bartender's head and beats her geriatric husband around the head with his own cane. Now, he gets a restraining order against her and she moves back to Michigan. The nuptials would be annulled and the 69-year-old yacht club guy could get back to looking for a, uh, well, a bit of a less psychopathic gold digger. A few years later, in 1981, she would be arrested all over Florida for various crimes. She would be accused of grand theft auto, armed robbery, passing forged checks, stealing guns, various assorted assaults, and pulling guns on people and demanding $200. Now, I found that a bit weird. $200 is a pretty specific number to try and mug someone for. So it probably goes something like this. I'm only going to rob you if you have $200. So you point a gun at somebody and go, Hey, give me $200 or I'll shoot you. And the guy goes, Hey, I've uh, only got $100. Is that good? Uh, no, that's not worth mugging you for. Okay then, sir. You keep that. I'll move on to the next person and see if they've got 200 Sorry for the inconvenience. No problem. Carry on. And what if you got over $200? Did she want you to keep the change? She doesn't sound like the best mugger in the world. Besides, you'd think she'd be so good at being a prostitute by now that she would be making tons of money and not have to mug people. I guess climbing the corporate hooker ladder is uh, harder than it seems. So, in 1987, she does something that's totally not illegal. She picks up a woman at a gay bar. Okay, they would move in together and Eileen would pay the bills with her sex money. The two girls would be accused of attacking people with beer bottles and Eileen would get into a ruckus with a bus driver. Yeah, so, you know, she's uh, established a pattern of being a little unhinged and she's doing a nice job of spreading it all over Florida. In 1989... Eileen goes off the deep end and takes the crazy up a bit of a notch. On November 30th, Richard Mallory had been looking to avail himself of Eileen's well-practiced skills. According to Wernos, he drove her off to a secluded area and beat, raped, and sodomized her violently. So, in self-defense... She shot him multiple times and stole his car. He abandoned his car. He didn't abandon his car. She abandoned his car. He didn't abandon it because he was dead. So uh, she abandons it, and it gets found two days later. And his body was found a few miles away on December 13th. In self-defense, she ran away in an effort to avoid detection. So, that, that looks a little shady. And uh, Mallory was actually a convicted sex offender. And Wernos and her lawyer would use this fact prominently in court later. Okay, so he's a convicted sex offender and she killed him. On June 1st, 1990, the naked body of David Spears was found alongside a Florida highway. He had been shot six times in self-defense. Five days later, the body of Charles Karskadon was found in Pasco County. at somewhere in Florida. He had been shot nine times and wrapped in an electric blanket. In self-defense, he had been lying around for a while and was a bit decomposed by the time he was discovered. And things started to unravel for Eileen around here because she gets spotted in the dead man's car and it comes to light that she had pawned one of his guns. Now, Peter seems 
went missing in June 1990. His car was found on July 4th after Eileen and her girlfriend had an accident in it. They had an accident in a stolen car and ran away from the scene in self-defense. Wernos! Palm print was found in the car, but Peter's body was never recovered. After all these shenanigans, the police and media started a campaign to get these fools off the streets. They started cross-referencing pawn shop receipts and found Wernos was linked to various items belonging to the victims. Not under her real name, of course. She made up multiple silly names to try and evade capture. She gave herself such monikers as Sandra Kretsch, Susan Blahovic, and Lori Grody. And it goes without saying that all of this was in self-defense, obviously. She would shoot and kill three more men with vehicles in self-defense in the next five months. Troy Burris would be shot twice. Dick Humphreys was shot seven times. And Walter Antonio was shot four times. All of their vehicles were stolen and later dumped off somewhere. So it seems to me, if you're in the market for a skank, the safest place to find them is on the bus if you're in Florida. In January of 1991, Wernos was sneakily avoiding detection by hanging out at exactly the sort of place she would have been expected to be. So she was picked up at a Florida biker bar on an outstanding warrant. Now, that's a good thing. But what about her accomplice? Her girlfriend was tracked down in Pennsylvania and was offered immunity if she would testify against her. The girlfriend would get coached by the police and made to call Eileen in an effort to get her to confess to the murders on record. After three days of coaxing, she would confess to the murders. But, but, under the stipulation that all the Johns tried to rape her and she acted totally in, ahem, self-defense. Jesus, sheesh. Okay, so she goes to trial for the first murder. That would be the Mallory murder. She is found guilty, based mainly on her girlfriend's testimony and various other mountains of evidence she has piled up against her. During her sentencing, her defense involves painting Mallory as a violent sex offender and proving that she was mentally unstable and suffering from borderline and antisocial personality disorders. It has little effect because four days later, She's given the death penalty. In 1992, she would plead no contest to three more of the murders. She would do this because she said she wanted to get, quote, right with God, end quote. Oh, come on, Eileen. I'm pretty sure God thinks you're a crazy bitch, too. I mean, he's not dumb. He's imaginary, but he's not fucking dumb. That's, that's going nowhere. That's not going to fly. She claimed that while Mallory did violently rape her, these other three Johns did not, but only because they didn't get the chance. According to Wernos, these other three had only, quote, started to, end quote, getting into the act of violently raping her. So in other words... She acted in preemptive self-defense because these assholes were inevitably going to fuck her up. Her self-defense bullshit couldn't defend her against racking up three more death sentences. So, she saves herself the trouble of groveling and just pleads guilty to the murders of Charles Karskadon and Walter Antonio. That brings the total to six death sentences, okay? She was never charged with the murder of Peter Seams 
because his body was never found. I don't think there's any doubt, though, that she was responsible for poor Pete's death. It would be hard for her to explain away why she was driving his car and smacking into things after he went missing. She would appeal her death sentence in 1996 and fail. In 2001, she would fire her lawyer and try to speed along her execution. She would say that she was, quote, cold as ice, end quote, and would kill again if given the chance and had hate coursing through her body. She stated that she was competent, sane, and able to make such a life-altering decision. Her defense said that she was incompetent, so they had to bring in three psychiatrists to evaluate her. And they all found her sane enough to be executed. So that's a good thing. While awaiting execution, she would complain of inhumane treatment at the prison. She accused the matrons of pissing and spitting on her food and cooking her potatoes in dirt. She claimed the guards wanted to rape her and drive her bonkers so that she would commit suicide. She also found some mildew on her mattress and the water pressure in the shower to be inadequate. I kind of think she has prison confused with the Holiday Inn. Her lawyer stated that she just wants to have, quote, proper humane treatment until the day she is executed, end quote. He also expressed concern that she could be delusional and making it all up. But he did think that, in her little world, she believed what she was saying. On October 9th, 2002, she was given 20 bucks to have whatever she wanted to eat, and she chose KFC. Her last words were, quote, Yes, I would just like to say I'm sailing with the rock, and I'll be back, like Independence Day with Jesus, June 6th, like the movie, Big Mother Ship and All, I'll be back, I'll be back, end quote. Okay. I uh, don't remember Jesus being in Independence Day, but uh, I could have been gone to the can during that part. She was injected at 9.30 a.m. or so, made a weird face, smirked a bit, closed her eyes, and flew off in her spaceship to be with the angels. She was pronounced dead at 9.47 a.m. She was the 10th woman executed in the United States since 1976. She was cremated and spread under a tree back in Michigan by a childhood friend. She requested that the song Carnival by Natalie Merchant be played at her funeral. Now, I like that song, so I'll give her that one. But she's still a cunt, and she got what was coming to her. She's had a couple of documentaries made about her, and Charlize Theron won an Oscar for her performance as Eileen Wernos in the 2003 movie Monster. You know what's funny? Charlize Theron won an award for pretending to be Eileen Wernos. Eileen Wernos didn't get any award for being the real Eileen Wernos. That is, unless you count getting shit-covered potatoes soaked in urine for lunch, an award. Which you probably don't. They also made her into an opera, and Jewel wrote a song called Nicotine Love about her. I'm just listing off random, uninteresting facts here. Yeah, you got me. I'm just stalling for time because this episode is too short. But it's over now! Come on, Dick, get on with it. So, there you have it. The story of Eileen Murnos is in the books. This has been another terrible episode of Evil Done Badly, and I hope you liked it, or at least tolerated it enough to come back and join us again next week. If you'd like to reach out to us and suggest further episodes, you can find us on Instagram at Evil Done Badly, or you can email us at EvilDoneBadly at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for hanging in there. You found our secret hidden mini episode. This is a quick rundown of the Amy Fisher story, and it is an excuse for me to say Badafuko multiple times. So... 
before we get started, let's cue the theme song for the hidden mini episode, which doesn't exist, so we'll make something up as we go. In 1992, Amy Fisher was 17 years old and was having an affair with Joey Buttafuoco. She wasn't married, but he was, to his wife, Mary Jo Buttafuoco. Now, Joey was much older than 17 and would later be found guilty of statutory rape of a minor. He would only be found out after Amy gets jealous of Mary Jo Buttafuoco and made up some horseshit story about Joey banging her imaginary sister who she was pretending to be. She showed Mary Jo a t-shirt with Joey's auto body company on it as proof that Joey was having sex with somebody who was not his wife. I hope you're following along here, because none of this makes any fucking sense. Naturally, Mary Jo gets a little upset and tells her to get the fuck away. So Amy then pulls out a gun that she got from some other car guy, who was also acting as her getaway driver, and shoots Mary Jo Buttafuoco in the face. Mary Jo would recover and identify Amy, or whatever the fuck she was calling herself, and Amy would be found guilty of first-degree aggravated assault. When it all shakes out, Amy does seven years in prison and gets paroled in 1999. She goes on to an illustrious career as a writer, a webcam model, whatever the fuck that is, and porno actress. So she's doing fine. Joey Buttafuoco does four months in jail for fucking a 16-year-old. And funnily enough, he does four months for fucking the 16-year-old, but he gets one year in prison for insurance fraud and is banned for life from operating an auto body company in the state of California. He's a minor celebrity now and has made various cameos on reality and talk shows. Mary Jo Buttafuoco looked up the definition of the word sociopath in the dictionary and decided that she needed to write a book about what an asshole her husband was. So she's moved on, and I hope she's doing well. These other two, well, they're probably doing well, but they can still go fuck themselves. Because they're very cunt-like. And there you have it again! The end of the episode! It's our first secret hidden mini episode, and I thank you for making it this far. This has been Evil Done Badly, the worst true crime podcast on the internet, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.